namo bhagavate vasudevaya om namo bhagavate vasudevaya om namo bhagavate vasudevaya narayanam namaskrityam naram chaiva narotamam devim sarasvatim vyasam tato jayam odirayet Nashta Prayeshva Badeshu Nityam Bhagavata Sevaya Bhagavati Uttama Shloke Bhakti Bhavati Naishtiki Reading from Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 4, The Description of the Fourth Order, Chapter 13, Description of the Descendants of Dhruva Maharaj. Translation by His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Srila Prabhupada. Sutta Goswami, continuing to speak to all the rishis headed by Shaunaka, said, After hearing Maitreya Rishi describing Dhruva Maharaj ascend to Lord Vishnu's abode, Vidura became very much enlightened in devotional emotion and he, he inquired from Maitreya as follows. Vidura inquired from Maitreya, O greatly advanced devotee, who were the Prachetas? To which family did they belong, whose sons were they, and where did they perform the great sacrifices? Vidura continued, I know that the great sage Narada is the greatest of all devotees. He has compiled the Pancharatrika procedure of devotional service and has directly met the Supreme Personality of Godhead. While all the Prachetas were executing religious rituals and sacrificial ceremonies and thus worshipping the Supreme Personality of Godhead for his satisfaction, the great sage Narada described the transcendental qualities of Dhruva Maharaj. My dear Brahmana, how did Narada Muni glorify the Supreme Personality of Godhead and what pastimes were described in that meeting? I am very eager to hear of them. Kindly explain fully about that glorification of the Lord. The great sage Maitreya replied, My dear Vidura, when Maharaj Dhruva departed for the forest, his son Utkal did not desire to accept the opulent throne of his father, which was meant for the ruler of all the lands of this planet. From his very birth Utkal was fully satisfied and unattached to the world. He was equipoised, for he could see everything resting in the Supersoul and the Supersoul present in everyone's heart. By expansion of his knowledge of the Supreme Brahman, he had already attained liberation from the bondage of the body. This liberation is known as Nirvana. He was situated in the transcendental bliss and he continued always in that blissful existence which expanded more and more. This was possible for him by continually practice of Bhakti Yoga, which is compared to fire because it burns away all dirty material things. He was always situated in his constitu constitutional position of self-realization and he could not see anything else but the Supreme Lord and engage and himself engaged in this discharging devotional service. Utkal appeared to the less intelligent persons on the road to be foolish, blind, dumb, deep and mad. Although actually he was not so, he remained like fire covered with ashes without blazing flames. For this reason the ministers and all the elderly members of the family sought Utkal to be without intelligence and in fact mad. Thus his younger brother named Vatsara, the son of Brahmi, was elevated to the royal throne and he became king of the world. King Vatsara had a very dear wife whose name was Svarviti and she gave birth to six sons named Pushparna, Tikmaketu, Isha, Urja, Vasu and Jaya. Pushparna had two wives named Prabha and Dosha. Prabha had three sons named Pratar, Madhya, Madhyandinam and Shayam. Dosha had three sons, Pradosha, Nishita and Vyushta. Vyushta's wife was named 
Pushkarini, and she gave birth to a very powerful son named Sarvateja. Sarvateja's wife, Akuti, gave birth to a son named Shakshusha, who became the sixth Manu at the end of the Manu millennium. Natvala, the wife of, of Chakshusha Manu, gave birth to the following faultless sons Puru, Kushta, Trita, Dyumna, Satyavan, Rita, Vrata, Agni, Stoma, Ati, Ratra, Pradyumna, Shibi, and Ulmuka. Of the twelve sons, Ulmuka begot six sons in his wife Pushkarini. They were all very good sons, and their names were Anga, Sumana, Kyati, Kratu, Angira, and Gaya. The wife of Anga, Sunita, gave birth to a son named Vina, who was very crooked. The saintly king Anga was very disappointed with Vina's bad character, and he left home and kingdom and went out to the forest. My dear Vidura, when great sages curse, their words are as invincible as a thunderbolt. Thus, when they cursed King Vena out of anger, he died. After his death, since there was no king, all the rogues and thieves flourished. The kim kingdom became unregulated, and all the citizens suffered greatly. On seeing this, the great sages took the right hand of Vena as a churning rod, and as a result of their churning, Lord Vishnu, in his partial representation, made his advent as King Prithu, the original emperor of the world. Vidura inquired from the sage Maitreya, My dear Brahmana, King Anga was very gentle. He had high character and was a saintly personality and a lover of Brahminical culture. How is it that such a great soul got a bad son like Vina, because of whom he became indifferent to his kingdom and left it? Vidura also inquired, How is it that the great sages, who were completely conversant with religious principles, desired to curse King Vena, who himself carried the rod of punishment, and thus awarded him the greatest puni punishment, Brahma Shapa. It is the duty of all citizens in a state never to insult the king, even though he sometimes appeared to have done something very sinful. Because of his prowess, the king is always more influential than all other ruling chiefs. Vidura requested Maitreya, My dear Brahmana, you are well conversant with all subjects, both past and future. Therefore I wish to hear from you all the activities of King Vena. I am your faithful devotee, so please explain this. She Maitreya replied, My dear Vidura, since the great King Anga arranged to perform the great sacrifice known as Ashwamedha, all the expert Brahmanas present knew how to invite the demigods, but in spite of their efforts, no demigods participated or appeared in that sacrifice. The priests engaged in the sacrifice then informed King Anga, O King, we are probably off properly offering the clarified butter in the sacrifice, but despite all our efforts, the demigods do not accept it. O King, we know that the paraphernalia to perform the sacrifice is well collected by you with great faith and care and is not polluted. Our chanting of the Vedic hymns is also not deficient in any way, for all the brahmanas and priests present here are expert and are executing the performances properly. Dear King, we do not find any reason that the demigods should feel insulted or neglected in any way. But still the demigods, who are witnesses for the sacrifice, do not accept their shares. We do not know why this is so. Maitreya explained that King Anga, after hearing the statements of the priests, was greatly grieved. At that time he took permission from the priests to break his silence and inquired from all the priests who were present in the sacrificial arena. King Anga addressed the priestly order. My dear priests, kindly tell me what offense I have committed. Although invited, the demigods are neither taking part in the sacrifice nor accepting their shares. The head priest said, O king, in this life we do not find any sinful activity, even within your mind, so you are not in the least offensive. 
but we can see that in your previous life you performed sinful activities due to which, in spite of your having all qualifications, you have no son. O King, we wish all good fortune for you. You have no son, but if you pray at once to the Supreme Lord and ask for a son, and if you execute the sacrifice for that purpose, the enjoyer of the sacrifice, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, will fulfill your desire. When Hari, the supreme enjoyer of all sacrifices, in, is invited to fulfill your desire for a son, all the demigods will come with him and take their shares in the sacrifice. The performer of the sacrifice under Karmakanda activities uh, achieves the fulfillment of the desire for which he worships the Lord. Thus, for the sake of a son, for King Anga, they decided to offer oblations to Lord Vishnu, who is situated in the hearts of all living entities. As soon as the oblation was offered in the fire, a person appeared from the fire altar, altar wearing a golden garland and a white dress. He was carrying a golden pot filled with rice boiled, boiled in milk. The king was very liberal and after taking permission from the priests, he took the preparation in his joint palms and after smelling it, he offered a portion to his wife. Although the queen had no son, after eating that food, which had the power to produce a male child, she became pregnant by her husband and in due course of time she gave birth to a son. That boy was born partially in the dynasty of irreligion. His grandfather was death personified and the boy grew up as his follower. He became a greatly irreligious person. After fixing his bow and arrow, arrow, the cruel boy used to go to the forest and unnecessarily kill innocent deer and as soon as he came, all the people would cry, here comes cruel Vena, here comes cruel Vena. The boy was so cruel that while playing with young boys of his age, he would kill them very merc mercilessly, as if they were animals meant for slaughter. After seeing the cruel and merciless behavior of his son, Vena, King Anga, punished him in different ways to reform him, but was unable to bring him to the path of gentleness. He thus became gra greatly aggrieved. The, the king saw to himself, persons who have no son are certainly fortunate. They must have worshipped the Lord in their previous life so that they would not have to suffer the unbearable unhappiness caused by a bad son. A sinful son causes a person's reputation to vanish. His Irreligious activities at home cause irreligion and quarrel among everyone, and this creates only endless anxiety. Who, if he is considerate and intelligent, would desire such a worthless son? Such a son is nothing but a bond of illusion for the living entity, and he makes one's home miserable. Then the king thought, a bad son is better than a good son, because a good son creates an attachment for home whereas a bad son does not. A bad son creates a hellish home from which an intelligent man naturally becomes very easily detached. Thinking like that, King Anga would not sleep at night. He became completely indifferent to household life. Once, therefore, in the dead of night, he got up from bed and left Vina's mother, his wife, who was sleeping deeply. He gave up all attraction for his greatly opulent kingdom and, unseen by anyone, he very silently gave up his home and opulence and proceeded towards the forest. When it was understood that the king had indifferently left home, all the citizens, priests, ministers, friends and people in general were greatly aggrieved. They began to search for him all over the world, just as a less experienced mystic searches for the super soul within himself. When the citizens could not find any trace of the king after searching for him everywhere, they were very disappointed and they returned to the city where all the great sages of the country assembled because of the king's absence. With tears in their eyes, the citizens after offered respectful obeisances and informed the sages in full detail that they were unable to find the king anywhere. Thus end the Bhaktivedanta purports to the fourth canto, 13th chapter of the Srimad Bhagavatam, entitled Description of the Descendants of Dhruva Maharaj. Chapter 14. The Story of King Vena. The great sage Maitreya continued, My dear Hiru, my dear, oh, 
O great hero Vidura, the great sages headed by Brigu were always thinking of the welfare of the people in general. When they saw that in the absence of King Anga there was no one to protect the interests of the people, they understood that without a ruler the people would become independent and non-regulated. The great sages then called for the Queen Mother Sunita and with her permission they installed Vina on the throne as master of the world. All the ministers, however, disagreed with this. It was already known that Vina was very severe and cruel. Therefore, as soon as all the thieves and rogues in the state heard of his ascendance to the royal throne, they became very much afraid of him. Indeed, they hid themselves here and there as rats hide themselves from snakes. When the king ascended to the throne, he became all-powerful with eight kinds of opulences. Consequently, he became too proud. By virtue of his false prestige, he considered himself to be greater than anyone. Thus he began to insult great personalities. When he became overly blind due to his opulences, King Vena mounted a chariot and, like an uncontrolled elephant, began to travel throughout the kingdom causing the sky and earth to tremble wherever he went. All the twice-born brahmanas were forbidden henceforward to perform any sacrifice, and they were also forbidden to give charity or offer clarified butter. Thus King Vena sounded kettle drums throughout the countryside. In other words, he stopped all kinds of religious rituals. Therefore all the great sages assembled together, and after observing cruel Vena's atrocities, concluded that a great danger and catastrophe was approaching the people of the world. Thus, out of compassion, they began to talk amongst themselves, for they themselves were the performance o performers of the sacrifices. When the great sages consulted one another, they saw that the people were in a dangerous position from both directions. When a blazing fire on both ends of a log when a fire blazes on both ends of a log, the ends in the middle are in a very dangerous situation. Similarly, at that time the people in general were in a dangerous position due to an irresponsible king on one side and thieves and rogues on the other. Thinking to save the state from irregularity, the sages began to co consider that it was due to a political crisis that they made Vina king, although he was not qualified. But alas, now the people were being disturbed by the king himself. Under such, such circumstances, how could the people be happy? The, sages began the great sages began to think within themselves, because he was born from the womb of Sunita, King Vena, by his nature very, is by his nature very mischievous. Supporting this mischievous king is exactly like maintaining a snake with milk. Now he has become a source of all difficulties. We appointed this, ki this Vena king of the state in order to give protection to the citizens, but now he has become the enemy of the citizens. Despite all these discrepancies, we should at once try to pacify him. By doing so, we may not be touched by the sinful results caused by him. The saintly sages continued thinking, of course we are completely aware of his mischievous nature, yet nevertheless we enthroned Vina. If we cannot persuade King Vina to accept our advice, he will be condemned by the public and we will join them. Thus by our prowess we shall burn him to ashes. The great sages, having thus decided, approached King Vina, concealing their real anger. They pacified him with sweet words and then spoke as follows. The great sages said, Dear King, we have come to give you good advice. Kindly hear us with great attention. By doing so, your duration of life and your opulence, strength and reputation will increase. Those who live according to religious principles and who follow them by words, mind, body and intelligence are elevated to the heavenly kingdom, which is devoid of all miseries. Being thus rid of the material influence, they achieve unlimited happiness in life. 
The sages continued, O great hero, for this reason you should not be the cause of spoiling the spiritual life of the general populace. If their spiritual life is spoiled because of your activities, you will certainly fall down from your opulent and royal position. The saintly persons continued, when the king protects the citizens from the disturbances of mischievous ministers as well as from thieves and rogues, he can, by virtue of such pious activities, accept taxes given by his subjects. Thus a pious king can certainly enjoy himself in this world as well as in the life after death. The king is supposed to be pious in whose state and cities the general populace strictly observes the system of eight social orders of Varna and Ashrama, and where all citizens engage in worshipping the Supreme Personality of Godhead by their particular occupations. O noble one, if the king sees that the Supreme Personality of Godhead, the original cause of the cosmic manifestation and the super soul within everyone is worshipped, the Lord will be satisfied. The Supreme Personality of Godhead is worshipped by the great demigods, controllers of universal affairs. When he is satisfied, nothing is impossible to achieve. For this reason, all the demigods, presiding deities of different planets as well as the inhabitants of their planets, take great pleasure in offering all kinds of paraphernalia for his worship. Dear King, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, along with the predominating deities, is the enjoyer of the results of all sacrifices in all planets. The Supreme Lord is the sum total of the three Vedas, the owner of everything and the ultimate goal of all austerity. Therefore your countrymen sh should engage in performing various sacrifices for your elevation. Indeed, you should always direct them towards the offering of sacrifices. When all the Brahmanas engage in performing sacrifices in your kingdom, all the demigods, who are plenary expansions of the Lord, will be very much satisfied by their activities and will give you your desired results. Therefore, O hero, do not stop the sacrificial performances. If you stop them, you will respect, disrespect the demigods. King Vena replied, you are not at all experienced. It is very much regrettable that you are maintaining something which is not religious and are accepting it as religious. Indeed, I think you are giving up your real husband who maintains you and are searching after some paramour to worship. Those who, out of gross ignorance, do not worship the king, who is actually the Supreme Personality of Godhead, experience happiness neither in this world nor the, in the world after death. You are so much devoted to the demigods, but who, but who are they? Indeed, your affection for these demigods is exactly like the affection of an unchaste woman who neglects her married life and gives all attention to her paramour. Lord Vishnu, Lord Brahma, Lord Shiva, Lord Indra, Vayu, the master of air, Yama, the superintendent of death, the sun god, the director of rainfall, Kuvera, the treasurer, the moon god, the predominating deity of the earth, Agni, the fire god, Varuna, the lord of waters, and all others who are great and competent to bestow benedictions or to curse, all abide in the body of the king. For this reason the king is known as the reservoir of all demigods, who are simply parts and parcels of the king's body. King Vena continued, For this reason, O Brahmanas, you should abandon your envy of me, and by your ritualistic ceremonies you should worship me and offer me all paraphernalia. If you are intelligent, you should know that there is no personality superior to me who can accept the first oblations of all sacrifices. The great sage Maitreya continued, Thus the king, who became unintelligent due to his sinful life and deviation from the right path, became actually bereft of all good fortune. He could not accept the requests of the great sages, which the sages put before him with great respect, and therefore he was condemned. My dear Vidura, all good fortune unto you. The foolish king, who thought himself very learned, thus in Salted the great sages, and the sages, being broken hearted by the king's words, became very angry at him. All the great saintly sages immediately cried, Kill him, kill him, he is the most dreadful, sinful person. If he lives, he will certainly turn the whole world into ashes in no time. The saintly sages continued, This impious, impudent man does not deserve to sit on the throne at all. He is so shameless that he even dared insult the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Lord Vishnu. 
but for King Vena, who is simply inauspicious, who would blaspheme the Supreme Personality of Godhead by whose mercy one is awarded all kinds of fortune and opulences? The great sages, thus manifesting their covert anger, immediately decided to kill the king. King Vena was already as good as dead due to his blasphemy against the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Thus, without using any weapons, the sages killed King Vena simply by high-sounding words. After all the sages returned to their respective hermitages, the mother of King Vena, Sunita, became very much aggrieved because of her son's death. She decided to preserve the dead body of her son by the application of certain ingredients and by chanting mantras, mantra yogena. Once upon a time, the same saintly persons, after taking their baths in the river Saraswati, began to perform their daily duties by offering oblations into the sacrificial fires. After this, sitting on the bank of the river, they began to talk about the transcendental person and his pastimes. In those days there were various disturbances in the country that were creating a panic in society. Therefore all the sages began to talk amongst themselves. Since the king is dead and there is no protector of the world, misfortune may befall the people in general on account of rogues and thieves. The great sages were carrying on their discussion in this way. They saw a dust storm arising from all directions. This storm was caused by the running of thieves and rogues who were engaged in plundering the citizens. Upon seeing the dust storm, the saintly persons could understand that there were a great deal of irregularities due to the death of King Vena. Without government, the state was devoid of law and order and consequently there was a great uprising of murderous thieves and rogues. Who are, plundering, who are plundering the riches of the people in general. Although the great sages could subdue the disturbance by their powers, just as they could kill the king, they considered it improper on their part to do so. Thus, they did not attempt to stop the disturbance. The great sages be began to think that although a brahmana is peaceful and impartial because he is equal to everyone, it is still not his duty to neglect poor humans. By such neglect a brahmana's spiritual power diminishes, just as water kept in a cracked pot leaks out. The sages decided that the descendants of the family of the saintly king Ang Anga should not be stopped, for in, in this family the semen was very powerful and the children were prone de to become devotees of the Lord. After making a decision, the saintly person and sages churned the thighs of the dead body of King Vena with great force and according to a specific method. As a result of this churning, a dwarf-like person was born from King Vena's body. This person born from King Vena's thighs was named Bahuka and his complexion was as black as a crow's. All the limbs of his body were very short, his arms and legs were short and his jaws were large. His nose was flat and his eyes were reddish and his hair was copper colored. He was very submissive and meek and immediately after his birth he bowed down and inquired, Sirs, what shall I do? The great sages replied, Please sit down, Nishida. Thus Nishada, the father of the Nishada race, was born. After his Nishada's birth he immediately took charge of all the resultant actions of King Vena's sinful activities. As such, this Nishada class are always engaged in sinful activities like stealing, plundering and hunting. Consequently, they are only allowed to live in the hills and forests. Thus end the Bhaktivedanta purpose of the fourth canto, 14th chapter of the Srimad Bhagavatam entitled The Story of King Vena. Chapter 15 King Prithu's Appearance and Coronation the great sage Maitreya continued, My dear Vidura, thus the Brahmanas and the great sages again churned the two arms of King Vena's dead body. As a result, a male and female couple came out of his arms. The great sages were highly learned in Vedic knowledge. When they saw the male and female born of the arms of Vena's body, they were very pleased, for they could understand that the couple was an expansion of a plenary portion of Vishnu, the Supreme Personality of Godhead. 
The great sages said, the male is a plenary expansion of the power of Lord Vishnu who maintains the entire universe and the female is a plenary expansion of the goddess of fortune who is never separated from the Lord. Of the two, the male will be able to expand his reputation throughout the world. His name will be Prithu. Indeed, he will be the first among kings. The female has such beautiful teeth and beautiful qualities that she will actually beautify the ornaments she wears. Her name will be Archie, and the future and in, in the future she will accept King Prithu as her husband. In the form of King Prithu, the Supreme Personality of Godhead has appeared through a part of his potency to protect the people of the world. The Goddess of Fortune is a constant companion, companion of the Lord and therefore she has incarnated partially as Archie to become King Prithu's queen. The great sage Maitreya continued, My dear Vidu Viduraji, at that time all the Brahmanas highly praised and glorified King Prithu and the best singers of Gandharva Loka chanted his glories. The inhabitants of Siddha Loka showered flowers and the beautiful woman in the heavenly planets danced in ecstasy. Conch shells, bugles, drums and kettle drums vibrated in outer space. Great sages, forefathers and personalities from the heavenly planets all came to earth from various planetary systems. Lord Brahma, the master of the entire universe, arrived there accompanied by all the demigods and their chiefs. Seeing the lines of Lord Vishnu's palm on King Prithu's right hand and impressions of lotus flowers on the soles of his feet, Lord Brahma could understand that King Prithu was a partial representation of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, one whose palm bears the sign of a disc as well as other such lines should be considered a partial representation of the or incarnation of the Supreme Lord. The learned Brahmanas, who were very attached to the Vedic ritualistic ceremonies, then arranged for the king's coronation. People from all directions collected all the different paraphernalia for the ceremony. Thus everything was complete. All the rivers, seas, hills, mountains, serpents, cows, birds, animals, heavenly planets, the earthly planet, and all other living entities collected various presentations according to their ability to offer the king. Thus the great king Prithu, exquisitely dressed with garments and ornaments, was coronated and placed on the throne. The king and his wife Archie, who was also exquisitely ornamented, appeared exactly like fire. The great sage continued, My dear Vidura, Kuvera presented the great king Prithu with a golden throne. The demigod Varuna presented him with an umbrella that constantly sprayed fine particles of water and was as brilliant as the moon. The demigod of air, Vayu, presented King Prithu with two whisks, chamaras of hair. The king of religion, Dharma, presented him with a flower garland which, was, which would expand his fame. The king of heaven, Indra, presented him with a valuable helmet and the superintendent of death, Yamaraj, presented him with a scepter with which to rule the world. Lord Brahma presented King Prithu with a protective garment and made of spiritual knowledge. Bharati Saraswati, the wife of Brahma, gave him a transcendental necklace. Lord Vishnu presented him with a Sudarshan disc and Lord Vishnu's wife, the goddess of fortune, gave him imperishable opulences. Lord Shiva presented him with a sword within a, a sheath marked with ten moons, and his wife, the goddess Durga, presented him with a shield marked with one hundred moons. The moon demigod presented him with horses made of nectar, and the demigod Vishwakarma presented him with, with a very beautiful chariot. The demigod of fire, Agni, presented him with a bow made of the horns of goats and cows. The sun god presented him with arrows as brilliant as sunshine. The predominating deity of Burloka presented him with slippers full of mystic power, and the demigods from outer space brought him presentations of flowers again and again. The demigods who always travel in outer space gave bring King Prithu the arts to perform dramas, sing songs, play musical instruments and disappear at his will. The great sages also offered him infallible blessings. The ocean offered him a conch shell produced from the ocean. The seas, mountains and rivers gave him room to drive his chariot without impediments, and a Sutta, a Magada and a Vandi offered prayers and praises. 
they all presented themselves before him to perform their respective duties. Thus, when the greatly powerful King Prithu, the son of Vena, saw the professionals before him to gr congratulate them, he smiled, and with gravity of the vibrating sounds of clouds, he spoke as follows. King Prithu said, O gentle Sutta, Magadha, and other devotee offering prayers, the quality of which you have spoken are not distinct in me. Why then should you praise me for all these qualities, when I do not shelter these features? I do not wish for these words meant for me to go in vain, but it is better that they be offered to someone else. O gentle reciters, offer such prayers in due course of time when the qualities of which you have spoken actually manifest themselves in me. The gentle who offer prayers to the Supreme Personality of Godhead do not attribute such qualities to a human being who does not actually have them. How could an intelligent man, competent enough to possess such exalted qualities, allow his followers to praise him if he did not actually have them, praising a man by saying that if he were educated he might have become a great scholar or great personality is nothing but a process of cheating. A foolish person who agrees to accept such praise does not know that such words simply insult him. As a person with a sense of honor and magnanimity does not like to hear about his abominable actions, a person who is very famous and powerful does not like to hear himself praised. King Prithu continued, My dear devotees, had it by the Sutta, just now I am not very famous for my personal activities because I have not done anything praiseworthy you could glorify. Therefore, how could I engage you in praising my activities exactly like children. Thus end the Bhaktivedanta purpose of the fourth canto, 15th chapter of the Srimad Bhagavatam, entitled King Prithu's Appearance and Coronation. Chapter 16. Praise of King Prithu by the Professional Reciters. The great sage Maitreya continued, While King Prithu thus spoke, the humility of his nectarine speeches pleased the reciters very much. Then again they continued to praise the king highly with exalted prayers, as they had been instructed by the great sages. The reciters continued, Dear king, you are a direct incarnation of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Lord Vishnu, and by his causeless mercy you have descended on this earth. Therefore it is not possible for us to actually glorify your exalted activities. Although you have appeared through the body of King Vena, even great orators and speakers like Lord Brahma and other demigods cannot exactly describe the glorious activities of your Lordship. Although we are unable to glorify you adequately, we nonetheless have a transcendental taste for glorifying your activities. We shall try to glorify you according to the instructions received from authoritative, authoritative sages and scholars. Whatever we speak, however, is always inadequate and very insignificant. Dear King, because you are a direct incarnation of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, all your activities are liberal and ever laudable. This King, Maharaj Prithu, is the best among those who are following religious principles. As such, he will engage everyone in the pursuit of religious principles and give those principles all protection. He will also be a great chastiser to the irreligious and atheistic. This King alone, in his own body, will be able to in due course of time to maintain all living entities and keep them in a pleasant condition by manifesting himself as different demigods to perform various departmental activities. Thus, we he thus he will maintain the upper planetary system by inducing the populace to perform Vedic sacrifices. In due course of time he will also maintain this earthly planet by discharging proper rainfall. This King Prithu will be as powerful as the Sun God, and just as the Sun God equally distributes his sunshine to everyone, King Prithu will distribute his mercy equally. Similarly, just as the Sun God evaporates water for eight months and during the rainy season returns it profusely, this King will also exact taxes from the citizens and return these monies in time of need. This King Prithu will be very, very kind to all citizens, even though a poor person may trample over the king's head by violating the rules and regulations. The king, out of his causeless mercy, will be forgetful and forgiving. As a protector of the world, he will be as tolerant as the earth itself. 
When there is no rainfall and the citizens are in great danger due to the scarcity of water, this royal personality of Godhead will be able to supply rains exactly like the heavenly king Indra. Thus he will very easily be able to protect the citizens from drought. This king Prithumaraj, by virtue of his affectionate glances and beautiful moonlike face, which is always smiling with great affection for the citizens, will enhance everyone's peaceful life. The recitals continued. No one will be able to understand the policies the king will follow. His activities will also be confidential, and it will not be possible for anyone to know how he will make every activity successful. His treasury will always remain unknown to everyone. He will be, he will be the reservoir of unlimited glories and good qualities, and his position will be maintained and covered, just as Varuna, the deity of the seas, is covered all around by water. King Prithu was born of the dead body of King Vena as fire is produced from Arani wood. Thus King Prithu will always remain just like fire and his enemies will not be able to approach him. Indeed, he will be unbearable to his enemies, for although staying very near him, they will never be able to approach him but will have to remain as, fa as if far away. No one will be able to overcome the strength of King Prithu. King Prithu will be able to see all the in internal and external activities of every one of his citizens. Still no one will be able to know his system of espionage, and he himself will remain neutral regarding all matters of glorification or vilification paid to him. He will be exactly like air, the life force within the body, which is exhibited internally and externally, but is always neutral to all affairs. Since this king will always remain on the path of piety, he will be neutral to both his son and the son of his enemy. If the son of his enemy is not punishable, he will not punish him. But if his own son is punishable, he will immediately punish him. Just as a sun god expands his, su his shining rays up to the arctic region without impedance, the influence of King Prithu will cover all tracts of land up to the arctic region and will remain undisturbed as long as he lives. This king will please everyone by his practical activities and all, all of his citizens will remain very satisfied. Because of this the citizens will take great satisfaction in accepting him as their ruling king. The king will be firmly determined and always situated in truth. He will be a lover of the Brahminical culture and will render all service to old men and give shelter to all surrendered souls. Giving respect to all, he will always be merciful to the poor and innocent. The king will respect all women as if they were his own mother and he will treat his own wife as the other half of his body. He will be just like an affectionate father to his citizens and he will treat himself as the most obedient servant of the devotees who always preach the glories of the Lord. The king will consider all embodied living entities as dear as his own self and he will always be increasing the pleasures of his friends. He will intimately associated with he will intimately associate with liberated persons and he will be a chastising hand to all impious persons. This king is a master of the three worlds and he is directly empowered by the Supreme Personality of Godhead. He is without change and he is an incarnation of the Supreme known as Shaktyavesha Avatar. Being a liberated soul and completely learned, he sees all materially vi material varieties as meaningless because their basic principle is Nashians. This king, being uniquely powerful and heroic, will have no competitor. He will travel around the globe on his victorious chariot, holding his invincible bow in his hand and appearing exactly like the sun, which rotates in its own orbit from the south. When the king travels all over the world, all other kings, as well as the demigods, will offer him all kinds of presentations. Their queens will also consider him the original king who carries in his hands the emblems of club and disc and will sing of his fame, for he will be as reputable as the Supreme Personality of Godhead. This king, this protector of the citizens, is an extraordinary king, 
and is equal to the Prajapati demigods. For the living facility of all citizens he will milk the earth, which is like a cow. Not only that, but he will level the surface of the earth with the pointed ends of his bow, breaking all the hills, exactly as King Indra, the heavenly king, breaks mountains with his powerful thunderbolt. When the lion travels in the forest, with its tail turned upwards, all menial animals hide themselves. Similarly, when King Prithu will travel over his kingdom and vibrate the string of his bow, which is made of the horns of goats and bulls and is irresistible in battle, all demoniac rogues and thieves will hide themselves in all directions. At the source of the river Saraswati, this king will perform 100 sacrifices known as Ashwamedha. In the course of the last sacrifice, the heavenly king Indra will steal the sacrificial horse. This king Prithu will meet Sanat Kumara, one of the four Kumaras, in the garden of his palace compound. The king will worship him with devotion and will be fortunate to receive instructions by which one can enjoy transcendental bliss. In this way, when the chivalrous activities of King Prithu come to be known to the people in general, King Prithu will always hear about himself and his uniquely powerful activities. No one will be able to disobey the, order of Prithu Maharaj, the orders of Prithu Maharaj. After conquering the world, he will completely eradicate the threefold miseries, miseries of the citizens. Then he will be recognized all over the world. At that time, both the Asuras and the Asuras will undoubtedly, undoubtedly glorify his magnanimous activities. Thus end the Bhaktivedanta purports of the fourth canto, sixteenth chapter of the Srimad Bhagavatam, entitled Praise of King Prithu by the Professional Reciters. Chapter 17. Maharaj Prithu becomes angry at the earth. The great sage Maitreya continued, In this way the reciters who were glorifying Maharaj Prithu readily described his qualities and chival chivalrous activities. At the end, Maharaj Prithu offered them various presentations with all due respect and worshipped them adequately. King Prithu, thus satisfied and off offered all respect to all the leaders of the Brahmanas and other castes, to his servants, to his ministers, and to the priests, citizens, general countrymen, people from other countries, admirers, and others, and thus they all became happy. Vidura, Vidura inquired from the great sage Maitreya, My dear Brahmana, since Mother Earth can appear in different shapes, why did she take the shape of a cow? And when King Prithu milked her, who became the calf and what was the milking pot? The surface of the earth is by nature low in some places and high in others. How did King Prithu level the surface of the earth and why did the king of heaven, Indra, steal the horse meant for the sacrifice? The great saintly king Maharaj Prithu received knowledge from Sanat Kumara, who was the greatest Vedic scholar. After receiving knowledge to be applied practically in his life, how did the saintly king attain his desired destination? Prithu Maharaj was, as, was a powerful incarnation of Lord Krishna's potencies. Consequently, any narration concerning his activities is surely very pleasing to hear, and it produces all good fortune. As far as I am concerned, I am always your devotee as well as the devotee of the Lord, who is known as Adokshaya. Please therefore narrate all the stories of King Prithu, who, in the form of the son of King Vena, milked the cow-shaped earth. Sutta Goswami con continued, When Vidura became inspired to hear of the activities of Lord Krishna in his various incarnations, Maitreya, also being inspired and being very pleased with Vidura, began to praise him. Then Maitreya spoke as follows. The great sage Maitreya continued, My dear Vidura, at the time King Prithu was enthroned by the great sages and brahmanas and declared to be the protector of the citizens, there was a scarcity of food grains. The citizens actually became skinny due to starvation. Therefore they came before the king and inform informed him of their real situation. Dear king, just as a tree with a fire burning in the hollow of the trunk gradually dries up. We are drying up due to the fire of hunger in our stomachs. You are the protector of the surrendered souls and you have been appointed to give, uh, give employment to us. Therefore we have all come to you for protection. 
You are not only a king, but the incarnation of God as well. Indeed, you are the king of all the kings. You can give us all kinds of occupational engagements, for you are the master of our livelihood. Therefore, O king of all kings, please arrange to satisfy our hunger by the proper distribution of food grains. Please take care of us, lest we soon die for want of food. After hearing this lamentation and seeing the pitiable condition of the citizens, King Prithu contemplated this matter for a long time to see if he could find out the underlying causes. Having arrived at the conclusion, the king took up his bow and arrow and aimed them at the earth, exactly like Lord Shiva who destroys the whole world out of anger. When the earth saw that King Prithu was taking his bow and arrow to kill her, she became very much afraid and began to tremble. She then began to flee, exactly like a deer, which runs very swiftly when followed by a hunter. Being afraid of King Prithu, she took the shape of a cow and began to run. Seeing this, Maharaj Prithu became very angry, and his eyes became as red as the early morning sun. sun. Placing an arrow on his bow, he chased the cow-shaped earth wherever she would run. The cow-shaped earth ran here and there in outer space between the heavenly planets and the earth, and wherever she ran, the king chased her with his bow and arrows. Just as a man cannot escape the cruel hands of death, the cow-shaped earth could not escape the hands of the son of Vena. At length, the earth, fearful, her heart, heart aggrieved, turned back in helplessness. Addressing the great opulent king Prithu as the knower of religious princi principles and shelter of the surrendered, she said, Please save me, you are the protector of all living entities. Now you are situated as the king of this planet. The cow-shaped earth continued to appeal to the king. I am very poor and I have not committed any sinful activities. I do not wa know why you want to kill me. Since you are supposed to be the knower of all religious principles, why are you so envious of me and why are you so anxious to kill a woman? Even if a woman does commit some sinful activity, no one should place his hand upon her. And what to speak of you, dear king, who are so merciful. You are a protector and you are affectionate to the poor. The cow-shaped earth continued, My dear king, I am just like a strong boat and all the paraphernalia of the world is standing upon me. If you break me to pieces, how can you protect yourself and your subjects from drowning? King Prithu replied to the earthly planet, My dear earth, you have disobeyed my orders and rulings. In the form of a demigod, you accepted your share of the yagnas we performed, but in return you have not produced sufficient food grains. For this reason I must kill you. Although you are eating green grass every day, you are not fulfilling your milk bag, so we can utilize your milk. Since you are willfully committing offenses, it cannot be said that you are not punishable due to your assuming the form of a cow. You have so lost your intelligence that despite my orders, you do not deliver the seeds of herbs and grains formerly created by Brahma and now hidden within yourself. Now, with the help of my arrows, I shall cut you to pieces with your flesh and with your flesh satisfy the hunger-stricken citizens who are now crying for want of grains. Thus I shall satisfy the crying citizens of my kingdom. Any cruel persons, person, be, be he a man, woman or impotent and nuke, who is only interested in his personal maintenance and has no compassion for other living entities, may be killed by the king. Such killing can never be considered actual killing. You are very much puffed up with pride and have become almost insane. Presently you have assumed the form of a cow by your mystic powers. Nonetheless, I shall cut you into small pieces like grain, and I will uphold the entire population by my personal mystic powers. At this time, Prithu Maharaj became exactly like Yamaraj, and his whole body appeared very angry. In other words, he was anger personified. After hearing him, the planet Earth began to tremble. She surrendered and with folded hands began to speak as follows. The planet Earth spoke. My dear Lord, O Supreme Personality of Godhead, you are transcendental in your position, and by your material energy you have expanded yourself in various forms and species of life through the interaction of the three modes of material nature. Unlike some other masters, you always remain in your transcendental position and are not affected by the material creation, which is subject 
to different material interactions. Consequently, you are not bewildered by material activities. The planet Earth continued, My dear Lord, you are the complete conductor of material creation. You have created this cosmic manifestation and the three material qualities, and therefore you have created me, the planet Earth, the resting place of all living entities. Yet you are always fully independent, my Lord. Now that you are present before me and ready to kill me with your weapons, let me know where I should go to take shelter and tell me who can give me protection. In the beginning of creation you created all the moving and non-moving living entities by your inconceivable energy. Through this very same energy you are now prepared to protect the living entities. Indeed, you are the supreme personality of religious principles. Why are you so anxious to kill me, even though I am in the form of a cow? My dear Lord, although you are one, by your inconceivable, inconceivable potencies you have expanded yourself in many forms. Through the agency of Brahma, you have created this universe. You are therefore directly the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Those who are not sufficiently experienced cannot understand your transcendental activities because these persons are covered by your illusory energy. My dear Lord, by your own potencies, you are the original cause of the material elements as well as the performing instruments, the senses, the workers of the senses, the controlling demigods the intelligence and the ego as well as everything else. By your energy you manifest this entire cosmic creation, maintain it and dissolve it. Through your energy alone everything is sometimes manifest and sometimes not manifest. You are therefore the Supreme Personality of Godhead, the cause of all causes. I offer my respectful obeisances unto you. My dear Lord, you are always unborn. Once in the form of the original boar you rescued, you rescued me from the waters of the in the bottom of the universe. Through your own energy you created all the physical elements, the senses and the heart for the maintenance of the world. My dear Lord, in this way you once protected me by rescuing me from the water and consequently your name has been famous as Dara Dara, he who holds the planet Earth. Yet at the present moment in the form of a great hero you are about to kill me with sharpened arrows. I am, however, just like a boat on the water, keeping everything afloat. My dear Lord, I am also the creation of one of your energies, composed of the three modes of material nature. Consequently, I am bewildered by your activities. Even the activities of your devotees cannot be understood and what to speak of your pastimes. Thus everything appears to us to be contradictory and wonderful. Thus end the Bhaktivedanta purports to the fourth canto, 17th chapter of the Srimad Bhagavatam, entitled Maharaj Prithu becomes angry at the earth. Chapter 18. Prithu Maharaj milks the earth planet. The great saint Maitreya continued to address Vidura. My dear Vidura, in that, at that time, after the planet earth finished her prayers, King Prithu was still not pacified, and his lips trembled in great anger. Although the planet Earth was frightened, she made up her mind and began to speak as follows in order to convince the king. My dear Lord, please pacify your anger completely and hear patiently whatever I have I submitted before you. Please turn your kind attention to this. I may be very poor, but a learned man takes the essence of knowledge from all places, just as a bumblebee collects honey from each and every flower. To benefit all human society, not only in this life, but in the next, the great seers and sages have prescribed various methods, me methods conducive to the prosperity of the people in general. One who follows the principles and instructions enjoined by the great sages of the past can utilize these instructions for practical purposes. Such a person can very easily enjoy life and pleasures. A foolish person who manufactures his own ways and means through mental speculation and does not recognize the authority of the sages who lay down unimpeachable directions is simply unsuccessful again and again in his attempts. My dear king, the seeds, roots, herbs and grains which were created by Lord Brahma in the past are now being used by non-devotees who are devoid of all spiritual understanding. My dear king, not only are grains and herbs being used by non-devotees, non but as far as I am concerned, I am not being proper, properly maintained. Indeed, I am being neglected by kings who are not punishing these rascals who have turned into thieves by using grains for sense gratification. 
Consequently, I, I have hidden all these seeds which were meant for the performance of sacrifice. Due to being stocked for a very long time, all the grain seeds within me have certainly deteriorated. Therefore, you should immediately arrange to take these seeds out by the standard process which is recommended by the Acharyas or Shast Shastras. <coughs> o great hero, protector of living entities, if you desire to relieve the living entities by supplying them sufficient grain and if you desire to nourish them by taking milk from me, you should make arrangements to bring a calf suitable for this purpose and a pot in which the milk can be kept, as well as a milkman to do the work. Since I will be very much affectionate towards my calf, your desire to take milk from me will be fulfilled. My dear king, may I, may I inform you that you have to make the entire surface of the globe level. This will help me even when the rainy season has ceased. Rainfall comes by the mercy of King Indra. Rainfall will remain on the surface of the globe, always keeping the earth moistened, and thus it will be auspicious for all kinds of production. After hearing the auspicious and pleasing words of the planet Earth, the king accepted them. He then transformed Svayambhuva Manu into a calf and milked all the herbs and grains from the earth in the form of a cow, keeping them in his cupped hands. Others who were as intelligent as King Prithu also took the essence out of the earthly planet. Indeed, everyone took this opportunity to follow in the footsteps of King Prithu and get whatever he desired from the planet Earth. All the great sages transformed Brihaspati into a calf, and making the senses into a pot, they milked all kinds of Vedic knowledge to purify words, minds and hearing. All the demigods made Indra the king of heaven into a calf, and from the earth they milked the beverage Soma, which is nectar. Thus they became very powerful in mental speculation and bodily and sensual strengths. The sons of Diti and the demons transformed Prahlad Maharaj, who was born in an Asura family, into a calf, and they extracted various kinds of liquor and beer, and they put in which they put into a pot made of iron. The inhabitants of Gandharva Loka and Apsara Loka made Vishwavasu into a calf, and they drew the milk into a lotus flower pot. The milk took the shape of sweet musical art and beauty. The fortunate inhabitants of Pitriloka, who preside over the funeral ceremonies, made Ayama into a calf. With great faith, they milked Kavya, food offered to the ancestors, into an unbaked earthen pot. After this, the inhabitants of Siddha Loka as well as inhabitants of Vidyadara Loka transformed the great sage Kapila into a calf and milking, making the whole sky into a pot, they milked out specific yogic mystic powers beginning with anima. Indeed, the inhabit inhabitants of Vidyadara Loka acquired the art of flying in the sky. Others also, the inhabitants of planets known as Kimpurusha Loka, made the demon Maya into a calf and they make milked out mystic powers by which one can disappear immediately from another's vision and appear again in a different form. Then the yakshas, rakshashas, ghosts and witches, who are habituated to eating flesh, transformed Lord Shiva's incarnation Rudra, Bhutanat, into a calf and milked out beverages made of blood and put them into a pot made of skulls. Thereafter, cobras and snakes without hoods, la large snakes, scorpions and many other poisonous animals took poison out of the planet Earth as their milk and kept this poison, poison in snake holes. They made a calf out of takshaka. The four-legged animals, like the cows, made a calf out of the bull who carries Lord Shiva and made a milking pot out of the forest. Thus they got fresh green grasses to eat. Ferocious animals like tigers transformed a lion into a calf, and thus they were able to get flesh for milk. The birds made a calf out of Garuda and took milk from the planet Earth in the form of moving insects and non-moving plants and grasses. The trees made a calf out of the banyan tree, and thus they derived milk. The trees made a calf out of the banyan tree, and thus they derived milk in the form of many delicious juices. The mountains transformed the Himalayas into a calf, and they milked a variety of minerals into a pot made of the peaks of hills. 
the planet Earth supplied everyone his respective food. During the time of King Pritu, the Earth was fully under the control of the king. Thus all the inhabitants of the Earth could get their food supply by creating various types of calves and putting their particular types of milk in various pots. My dear Vidura, chief of the crews, in this way King Pritu and all the others who subsist on food created different types of calves and milked out their respective eatables. Thus they received their various foodstuffs, which were symbolized as milk. Thereafter King Pritu was very satisfied with the planet Earth, for she sufficiently supplied all food to various living entities. Thus he developed an affection for the planet Earth, just as if she were his own daughter. After this, the king of all kings, Maharaj Prithu, leveled all raw, rough places on the surface of the globe by breaking up the hills with the strength of his bow. By his grace, the surface of the globe almost became flat. To all the citizens of the state, King Prithu was as good as a father. Thus he was visibly engaged in giving them proper substance and proper employment for substance. After level leveling the surface of the globe, he earmarked different places for residential quarters inasmuch as they were desirable. In this way the king founded many types of villages, settlements and towns and built, for and built forts, residences for cowherdsmen, stables for the animals and places for the royal camps, mining places, agricultural towns and mountain villages. Before the reign of King Pritu, there was no planned arrangement for different cities, villages, pasturing grounds, etc. Everything was scattered and everyone constructed his residential quarters according to his own convenience. However, since King Pritu, however, since King Pritu plans were made for towns and villages. Thus end the Bhaktivedanta purports of the 4th canto, 18th chapter of the Srimad Bhagavatam, entitled Prithu Maharaj milks the earth planet. Chapter 19. King Prithu's 100 horse sacrifices. The great sage Maitreya continued, My dear Vidura, King Prithu initiated the performance of 100 horse sacrifices at the spot where the river Saraswati flows towards the east. This piece of land is known as Brahmavarta and it was controlled by Swayambhuva Manu. When the most powerful Indra, the king of heaven, saw this, he considered the fact that King Prithu was going to exceed him in fruitive activities. Thus Indra could not tolerate the great sacrificial ceremonies performed by King Prithu. The Supreme Personality of Godhead, Lord Vishnu, is present in everyone's heart as a super-soul, and he is the proprietor of all planets and the enjoyer of the results of all sacrifices. He was personally present at the sacrifices made by King Prithu. When Lord Vishnu appeared in the sacrificial arena, Lord Brahma, Lord Shiva and all the chief pre predominating personalities of every planet as well as their followers came with him. When he appeared on the scene, the residents of Gandharva Loka, the great sages and the residents of Apsara Loka all praised him. The Lord was accompanied by the residents of Siddha Loka and Vidyadara Loka all the descendants of Diti and the demons and the Yakshas. He was also accompanied by his chief associates, headed by Sunanda and Nanda. Great devotees who were always engaged in the service of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, as well as the great sages named Kapila, Narada and Dattatreya, and masters of mystic powers, headed by Sanaka Kumara, all attended the great sacrifices with Lord Vishnu. My dear Vidura, in that great sacrifice, the entire land came to be like the milk-producing Kamadenu, and thus by the performance of Yogya, all daily necessities for life were supplied. The flowing rivers supplied all kinds of tastes, sweet, pun pungent, sour, etc., and very big trees supplied fruit and honey in abundance. The cows, having eaten sufficient green grass, supplied profuse quantities of milk, curd, clarified butter, and similar similar other necess necessities. King Prithu was presented with various gifts from the general populace and predominating deities of all planets. The oceans and seas were full of valuable jewels and pearls, and the hills were full of chemicals and fertilizers. Four kinds of edibles were produced profusely. King Prithu was dependent on the Supreme Personality of Godhead, who is known as Adokshaya. 
because King Pritu performed so many sacrifices, he was superhumanly enhanced by the mercy of the Supreme Lord. King Pritu's opulence, however, could not be tolerated by the King of he Heaven, Indra, who tried to impede the progress of his opulence. When Prithu Maharaj was performing the last horse sacrifice, Ashwamedha Yagya, King Indra, invisible to everyone, stole the horse intended for sacrifice. He did this because of the great because of his great envy of King Prithu. When King Indra was taking away the horse, he dressed himself to appear as a liberated person. Actually, this dress was a form of cheating, for it falsely created an impression of religion. When Indra went into outer space in this way, the great sage Atri saw him and understood the whole situation. When the son of King Prithu was informed by Atri of King Indra's trick, he immediately became very angry and followed Indra, t Indra to kill him, calling, wait, wait. King Indra was fraudulently dressed as a sannyasi, having knotted his hair on his head and smeared as ashes all over his body. Upon, upon seeing such dress, the son of King Prithu considered Indra a religious man and pious sannyasi. Therefore he did not release his arrows. When Adri Muni saw that the son of King Prithu did not kill Indra but returned deceived by him, Adri Muni again instructed him to kill the heavenly king because he saw that Indra had become the lowliest of all demigods due, hi due to his impeding the execution of King Prithu's sacrifice. Being thus informed, the grandson of King Vena immediately began to follow Indra, who was fleeing through the sky in great haste. He was very angry with him, and he chased him, just as the king of the vultures chased Ravana. When Indra saw that the son of Prithu was chasing him, he immediately abandoned his false dress and left the horse. Indeed, he disappeared from that very spot, and the great hero, the son of Maharaj Prithu, returned the horse to his father's sacrificial arena. My dear Lord Vidura, when the great sages observed the wonderful prowess of the son of King Prithu, they all agreed to give him the name Vijitaswa. My dear Vidura, Indra, being the king of heaven and very powerful, immediately brought a dense darkness upon the sacrificial arena. Covering the whole scene in this way, he again took away the horse, which was chained with golden shackles near the wooden instrument where the animals were sacrificed. The great sage Atri again pointed out to the son of King Prithu that Indra was fleeing through the sky. The great hero, the son of Prithu, chased him again. But when he saw that Indra was carrying in his hand a staff with a skull at the top and was again wearing the dress of a sannyasi, he still chose not to kill him. When the great sage Adri again gave directions, the son of Ki King Prithu became very angry and placed an arrow on his bow. Upon seeing this, King Indra immediately abandoned, abandoned the, dre the false dress of a sannyasi and giving up the horse made himself invisible. Then the great hero Vijitaswa, Vijitaswa the son of King Prithu, again took the horse and returned to his father's sacrificial arena. Since that time, certain men with a poor fund of knowledge have adopted the dress of a false sannyasi. It was King Indra who introduced this. Whatever different forms Indra assumed as a mendicant because of his desire to seize the horse were symbols of atheistic philosophy. In this way, King Indra, in order to steal the horse from King Prithu's sacrifice, adopted several, several orders of sannyas. Some sannyasis go naked and sometimes they wear red garments and pass under the name of Kapalika. These are simply symbolic representations of their sinful activities. These so-called sannyasis are very much appreciated by sinful men because they are all godless atheists and very expert in putting forward arguments and reasons to support their case. We must know, however, that they are only passing as adherents of religion and are not so in fact. Unfortunately, bewildered persons ac accept them as religious and being attracted to them, they spoil their life. Maharaj Prithu, who was celebrated as very powerful, immediately took up his bow and arrows and prepared to kill Indra himself, because Indra had introduced such irregu irregular sannyas orders. 
When the priest and all the others saw Maharaj Prithu very angry and prepared to kill Indra, they requested him, O great soul, do not kill him, for only sacrificial animals can be killed in a sacrifice. Such are the directions giving, given by Shastra. Dear King, Indra's powers are already reduced due to his attempt to impede the execution of your sacrifice. We shall call him by Vedic mantras, which were never before used, and certainly he will come. Thus, by the power of our mantra, we shall cast him into the fire, because he is your enemy. My dear Vidura, after giving the king this advice, the priest who had been engaged in performing the sacrifice called for Indra, the king of heaven, in a mood of great anger. When they were just ready to put the oblations in the fire, Lord Brahma appeared on the scene and forbade them to start the sacrifice. Lord Brahma addressed them thus, My dear sacrificial performers, you cannot kill in Indra, the king of heaven. It is not your duty. You should know that Indra is as good as the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Indeed, he is one of the most powerful assistants of the Personality of Godhead. You are trying to, s to satisfy all the demigods by the performance of this yajna. But you should know that all these demigods are but parts and parcels of Indra, the king of heaven. How then can you kill him in this great sacrifice? In order to make trouble and impede the performance of King Prithu's great sacrifice, King Indra has adopted some means that in the future will destroy the clear path of religious life. I draw your attention to this fact. If you oppose him any further, he will further misuse his power and introduce many other irreligious systems. Let there be only 99 sacrificial performances for Maharaj Prithu, Lord Brahma concluded. Lord Brahma then turned towards Maharaj Prithu and informed him that since he was thoroughly aware of the path of liberation, what was the use in performing more sacrifices? Lord Brahma continued, let there be good fortune to both of you, for you and King Indra were both parts, are both parts and parcels of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Therefore you should not be angry with King Indra, who is non-different from you. My dear King, do not be agitated and anxious because your sacrifices have not been properly executed due to providential impediments. Kindly take my words with great respect. We should always remember that if something happens by providential arrangements, we should not be very sorry. The more we try to rectify such reversals, the more we enter into the darkest region of materialistic thought. Lord Brahma continued, Stop the performance of these sacrifices, for they have introduced Indra to introduce so many religious systems, irreligious aspects. You should know very well that even amongst the demigods there are many unwanted desires. Just see how Indra, the king of heaven, was creating a disturbance in the midst of the sacrifice by stealing the sacrificial horse. These attractive sinful activities he has introduced will be carried out by the people in general. O King Prithu, son of Vena, you are the part and parcel expansion of Lord Vishnu. Due to the mischievous activities of King Vena, religious principles were almost lost. At that opportune moment you descended as the incarnation of Lord Vishnu. Indeed, for the protection of religious principles you have appeared from the body of King Vena. O protector of the people in general, please consider the purpose of your being incarnated by Lord Vishnu. The religious principles created by Indra are but mothers of so many unwanted religions. Please therefore stop these imitations immediately. The great sage Maitreya continued, When King Prithu was thus advised by the supreme teacher, Lord Brahma, he abandoned his eagerness to perform yagyas and with great affection concluded a peace with King Indra. After this, Prithu Maharaj took his bath, which is customarily taken after the performance of a yagya, and received the benedictions and due blessings of the demigods, who were very pleased by his glorious activities. With great respect, the original king, Prithu, offered all kinds of rewards to the brahmanas present at the sacrifice. Since all these brahmanas were very much satisfied, they gave their heartfelt blessings to the king. All the assembled sages and brahmanas said, O mighty king, by your invitation all classes of living entities have attended this assembly. They have come from Pit Pitriloka and the heavenly planets, and great sages as well as common men have attended this meeting. Now all of them 
are very much satisfied by your dealings and your charity towards them. Thus end the Bhaktivedanta purports of the 4th canto, 19th chapter of the Srimad Bhagavatam, entitled King Prithu's 100 Horse Sacrifices. Chapter 20 Lord Vishnu's Appearance in the Sacrificial Arena of Maharaj Prithu The great sage Maitreya continued, My dear Vidura, being very much satisfied by the performance of 99 horse sacrifices, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Lord Vishnu, appeared on the scene. Accompanying him was King Indra. Lord Vishnu then began to speak. Lord Vishnu, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, said, My dear King Prithu, Indra, the King of Heaven, has disturbed your execution execution of 100 sacrifices. Now he has come with me to be forgiven by you. Therefore excuse him. O King, one who is advanced in intelligence and eager to perform welfare activities for others is considered the best amongst human beings. An advanced human being is never malicious to others. Those with advanced intelligence are always conscious that this material body is different from the soul. If a personality like you, who are so much advanced because of executing the instructions of the previous Acharyas, is carried away by the influence of my material energy, then all your advancement may be considered simply a waste of time. Those who are in full knowledge of the bodily conception of life, who know that this body is composed of nescience, desires and activities resulting from illusion, do not become addicted to the body. How can a highly learned person who has absolutely no affinity for the bodily conception of life be affected by the bodily conception in regard to house, children, wells and similar other, bod similar other bodily productions? The individual soul is one, pure, non-material and self-effulgent. He is a reservoir of all good qualities and he is all-pervading. He is without material covering and he is a witness of all activities. He is completely distinguished from other living entities and he is transcendental to all embodied souls. Although within the material nature one who is thus situated in full knowledge of the Paramatma and Atma is never affected by the modes of material nature, for he is always situated in my transcendental loving service. The Supreme Personality of Godhead, Lord Vishnu continued, My dear King Prithu, when one situated in his occupational duty engages in my loving service without motive for material gain, he gradually becomes very satisfied within. When the heart is cleansed of all material contamination, the devotee's mind beco becomes broader and transparent and he can see things equally. At that stage of life there is peace and one is situated equally with me as Sachit Ananda Vigraha. Anyone who knows that this material body made of the five gross elements, the sense organs, the working senses and the mind is simply supervised by the fixed soul is eligible to be liberated from material bondage. Lord Vishnu told King Prithu, My dear King, the constant change of this material world is due to the interaction of the three modes of material nature. The five elements, the senses, the demigods who control the senses, as, as well as the mind, which is agitated by the aspiring soul, all these taken together comprise the body. Since the spiritual soul is completely different from this combination of gross and subtle material elements, my devotee, who is connected with me in intense friendship and affection, being completely in knowledge, is never agitated by material happiness and distress. My dear heroic king, please keep yourself always equipoised and treat people equally, whether they are greater than you in the intermediate stage or lower than you. Do not be disturbed by temporary distress or happiness. Fully control your mind and senses. In this transcendental posi position try to execute your duty as king in whatever condition of life you may be posted by my arrangement, for your only duty here is to give protection to the citizens of your kingdom to give protection to the general mass of people who are citizens of the state is the prescribed occup occupational duty for a king. By acting in this way, the king in his next life shares one-sixth of the results of the pious activities of the citizens, but the king or executive head of state who simply collects taxes from the citizens but does not give them proper protection as human beings has the results of his own pious activities taken away by the citizens and in exchange for his not giving protection he becomes liable to punishment for the impious activities of his subjects. Lord Vishnu continued, My 
Dear King Prithu, if you continue to protect the citizens according to the instructions of the learned Brahmana authorities, as they are re received by the disciplic succession, by hearing, from master to disciple, and if you follow the religious principles laid down by them, without attachment to ideas manufactured by mental, mental concoction, then every one of your citizens will be happy and will love you, and very soon you will be able to see such already liberated persons as the four Kumaras, Sanaka, San Natana, Sanandana and Sanat Kumara. My dear king, I am very captivated by your elevated qualities and excellent behavior, and thus I am very favorably inclined towards you. You may therefore ask from me any benediction you like. One who does not possess elevated qualities and behavior cannot possibly achieve my favor, simply by, o by performance of sacrifices, severe austerities or mystic yoga. But I always remain equipoised in the heart of one who is equipoised in all circumstances. The great saint, saint, saint Maitreya continued, My dear Vidura, in this way Maharaj Prithu, the conqueror of the entire world, accepted the instructions of the Supreme Personality of Godhead on his head. As King Indra was standing by, he became ashamed of his own activities and fell down before King Prithu to touch his lotus feet. But Prithu Maharaj immediately embraced him in great ecstasy and gave up all envy against him for his having stolen the horse meant for the sacrifice. King Prithu abundantly worshipped the lotus feet of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, who was so merciful to him. While worshipping the lotus feet of the Lord, Prithu Maharaj gradually increased his ecstasy in devotional service. The Lord was uh, just about to leave, but because he was so greatly inclined towards the behavior of King Prithu, he did not depart. Seeing the behavior of Maharaj Prithu with his lotus eyes, he was detained because he is always the well-wisher of his devotees. The original king, Maharaj Prithu, his eyes full of tears and his voice faltering and choked up, could neither see the Lord very distinctly nor speak to address the Lord in any way. He simply embraced the Lord within his heart and remained standing in that way with folded hands. The Supreme Personality of Godhead stood with his lotus feet, almost touching the ground, while he rested the front of his hand on the raised shoulder of Garuda, the enemy of the snakes, Maharaj Prithu, wiping the tears from his eyes, cried, tried to look upon the Lord, but it appeared that the king was not fully satisfied by looking at him. Thus the king offered the following prayers. My dear Lord, you are the best of the demigods who can offer benedictions. Why, therefore, should any learned person ask you for benedictions? meant for living entities bewildered by the mojo modes of nature. Such benedictions are available automatically even in the lives of living entities suffering in hellish conditions. My dear Lord, you can certainly bestow merging into your existence, but I do not wish to have such a benediction. My dear Lord, I therefore do not wish to have the benediction of mer merging into your existence, a benediction in which there is no existence of the nectarine beverage of your lotus feet. I want the benediction of at least one million ears, for thus I may be able to hear about the glories of your lotus feet from the mouths of your pure devotees. My dear Lord, you are glorified by the selected verses uttered by great personalities. Such glorification of your lotus feet is just like saffron particles. When the transcendental vibration from the mouths of great devotees carries the aroma of the saffron dust of your lotus feet, the forgetful living entity gradually remembers his eternal relationship with you. Devotee thus gradually come to the right conclusion about the value of life. My dear Lord, I therefore do not need any other benediction but the opportunity to hear from the mouth of your pure devotee. My dear highly glorified Lord, if one in the association of pure devotees hears even once the glories of your activities, he does not, unless he is nothing but an animal, give up the association of devotees for no intelligent person would be so careless as to leave their association. The perfection of chanting and hearing about your glories was accepted even by the goddess of fortune, who desired to hear of your unlimited activities and transcendental glories. Now I wish to engage in the service of the lotus feet of the Supreme Personality of Godhead and to serve just like the goddess of fortune who carries a lotus flower in her hand. 
Because his lordship, the supreme personality of Godhead, is the reservoir of all transcendental qualities, I am afraid that the goddess of fortune and I would quarrel because both of us would be attentively engaged in the same service. My dear lord of the universe, the goddess of fortune, Lakshmi, is the mother of the universe, and yet I think that she may be angry with me because of my intruding upon her service and acting on that very platform to which she is so much attached. Yet I am hopeful that even though there is some misunderstanding, you will take my part, for you are very much inclined to the poor and you always magnify even insignificant service unto you. Therefore, even though she becomes angry, I think that there is no harm for you, because you are so self-sufficient that you can do without her. Great saintly persons who are always liberated take to your devotional service, because only by devotional service can one be relieved from the illusions of material existence. O oh my Lord, there is no reason for the liberated souls to take shelter at your lotus feet, except that such souls are constantly thinking of your lotus feet. My dear Lord, what you have said to your unalloyed devotees is certainly very much bewildering. The allurements you offer in the Vedas are certainly not suitable for pure devotees. People in general, bound by the sweet words of the Vedas, engage themselves again and again in fruitive activities and armored by the results of their actions. My Lord, due to, your, due to your illusory energy, all living beings in this material world have forgotten their real constitutional position, and out of ignorance they are always desirous of material happiness in the form of society, friendship and love. Therefore, please do not ask me to take some material benefits from you, but as a father, not waiting for the son's demand, does everything for the benefit of the son. Please bestow upon me whatever you think best for me. The great sage Maitreya continued by saying that the Lord, the seer of the universe, after hearing Prithu Maharaj pray, Maharaj's prayer, addressed the king. My dear king, you, may you always be blessed by engaging in my devotional service, only by such purity of purpose as you yourself very intelligently express. Can one cross over the in, insurmountable illusory energy of Maya? My dear king, O protector of the citizens, henceforth be very careful to execute my orders and not be misled by anything. Anyone who lives in that way, simply carrying out my orders faithfully, will always find good fortune all, all over the world. The great saint Maitreya told Vidura, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, amply appreciate the, appreciated the meaningful prayers of Maharaj Prithu. Thus, after being properly worshipped by the king, the Lord blessed him and decided to depart. King Prithu worshipped the demigods, the great sages, the inhabitants of Pitriloka, the inhabitants of Gandharva Loka, and those of Siddha Loka, Charna Loka, Panaga Loka, Kinara Loka, Apsara Loka, the earthly planets, and the planets of the birds. He also worshipped many other living entities who presented themselves in the sacrificial arena. With folded hands, he worshipped all these, as well as the Supreme Personality of Godhead and the personal associates of the Lords by offering sweet words and as much wealth as possible. After this function, they all went back to their respective abodes, following in the footstep of Lord Vishnu. The infallible Supreme Personality of Godhead, having captivated the minds of the king and the priest who were present, returned to his abode in the spiritual sky. King Prithu then offered his respectful obeisances unto the, unto the Supreme Personality of Godhead, who is the Supreme Lord of all, demi all demigods. Although not an object of material vision, the Lord revealed himself to the sight of Maharaj Prithu. After offering obeisances to the Lord, the, ki re the king returned to his home. Thus end the Bhaktivedanta purports of the fourth canto, twentieth chapter of the Srimad Bhagavatam, entitled Lord Vishnu's appearance in the sacrificial arena of Maharaj Prithu. One instructions by Maharaj Prithu. Maitreya Uvacha. The great sage Maitreya told Vidura, when the king entered his city, it was very beautifully decorated to receive him with pearls, flowers, garlands, beautiful cloths, and golden gates, and the entire city was perfumed with highly fragrant incense. Fragrant water distilled from sandalwood and aguru herb was sprinkled everywhere on the lanes, roads, 
and small parks throughout the city and everywhere were decorations of unbroken fruits, flowers, wetted grains, varied minerals and lamps, all presented as auspicious paraphernalia. All the street crossing, at the street crossings there were bunches of fruits and flowers as well as pillars of banana trees and betel nut branches. All these combined decorations everywhere looked very attractive. As the king entered the gate of the city, all the citizens received him with many auspicious articles like lamps, flowers and yogurt. The king was also received, received by many beautiful unmarried girls whose bodies were bedecked with various ornaments, especially with earrings which collided with one another. When the king entered the palace, conch shells and kettle drums were sounded, priests chanted Vedic mantras and professional reciters offered different prayers. But in spite of all this ceremony to welcome him, the king was not the least bit affected. Both the important citizens and the common citizens welcomed the king very heartedly and he also bestowed upon them their desired blessings. King Prithu was greater than the greatest soul and was therefore worshipable by everyone. He performed many glorious activities in ruling over the surface of the globe and was always magnanimous. After it achieving such great success and a reputation which spread throughout the universe, he at last obtained the lotus feet of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Sutta Goswami continued, O Shaunaka, leader of the great sages, after hearing Maitreya speak about the various activities of King Prithu, the original king, who was fully qualified, glorified, glorified and pra widely praised all over the world, Vidura, the great devotee, very submissively worshipped Maitreya Rishi and asked him the following question. Vidura said, My dear Brahmana Maitreya, it is very enlightening to understand that King Prithu was enthroned by the great sages and brahmanas. All the demigods presented him with innumerable gifts and he also expanded his influence upon personally receiving strength, strength from Lord Vishnu. Thus he greatly developed the earth. Prithu Maharaj was so great in his activities and magnanimous in his message of, method of ruling that all the kings and demigods on the various planets still follow in his footsteps. Who is there who will not try to hear about his glorious activities? I wish to hear more and more about Prithu Maharaj because his activities are so pious and auspicious. The great saintly sage Maitreya told Vidura, My dear Vidura, King Prithu lived in the tract of land between the two great rivers Ganges and Yamuna. Because he was very opulent, it appeared that he was enjoy enjoying his destined fortune in order to diminish the results of his past pious activities. Maharaj Prithu was an unrivaled king and possessed the scepter for ruling all the seven islands on the surface of the globe. No one could disobey his irrevocable orders but the saintly persons, the brahmanas and the descendants of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, the Vaishnavas. Once upon a time King Prithu initiated the performance of a very great sacrifice in which great saintly sages, brahmanas, demigods from higher planetary systems and great saintly kings known as Raja Rajarshis all assembled together. In that great assembly, Maharaj Prithu first of all worshipped all the respectable visitors according to their respective positions. After this, he stood up in the midst of the assembly and it appeared that he, that the full moon had arisen amongst the stars. King Prithu's body was tall and sturdy and his complexion was fair. His arms were full and broad and his eyes as bright as the rising sun. His nose was straight, his face very beautiful, and his personality grave. His teeth were set beautiful in his smiling face. The chest of Maharaj Prithu was very broad, his waist was very thick, and his abdomen, wrinkled by lines of skin, resembled in construction a leaf of a banyan tree. His navel was coiled and deep, his thighs were of a golden hue, and his instep was arched. The black slick hair on his head was very fine and curly and his neck, like conch shells, was decorated with auspicious lines. He wore a very valuable dhoti and there was a nice wrapper on the upper part of his body. 
As Maharaj Prithu was being initiated to perform the sacrifice, he had to leave aside his valu valuable dress and therefore his natural bodily beauty was visible. It was very pleasing to see him put on a black deerskin and wear a ring of kusha grass on his finger. For this increased the natural beauty of his body. It appears that Maharaj Prithu observed all the regulative principles before he performed the sacrifice. Just to encourage the members of the assembly and to enhance their pleasure, King Prithu glanced over them with eyes that seemed like stars in a sky wet with dew. He then spoke to them in a great voice. Maharaj Prithu's speech was very beautiful and full of metaphorical language, clearly understandable and very pleasing to hear. His words were all grave and certain. It appeared it appears that when he spoke, he expressed his personal realization of the absolute truth in order to benefit all who were present. King Prithu said, O gentle members of the assembly, may all good fortune be upon you. May all of you great souls who have come to attend this meeting kindly hear my prayer attentively. A person who is actually inquisitive must present his decision before an assembly of noble souls. King Prithu continued, By the grace of the Supreme Lord, I have been appointed the king of this planet, and I carry the scepter to rule the citizens, protect them from all danger, and give them employment according to their respective positions in the social order established by Vedic injunction. Maharaj Prithu said, I think that upon the execution of my duties as king, I shall be able to achieve the desirable objectives described by experts in Vedic knowledge. <clears throat> this destination is certainly achieved by the pleasure of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, who is the seer of all destiny. Any king who does not teach his citizens about their respective duties in terms of varna and ashrama, but who simply exacts tolls and taxes from them, is liable to suffer for the impious activities which have been performed by the citizens. In addition to such degradation, the king also loses, loses his own fortune. Prithu Maharaj continued, Therefore, my dear citizens, for the welfare of your king after his death, you should execute your duties properly in terms of your positions of Varna and Ashram, and should always think of the Supreme Personality of Godhead within your hearts. By doing so, you will protect your own interests, and you will bestow mercy upon your king for his welfare after death. I request all the pure-hearted demigods, forefathers and saintly persons to support my proposal, for after death the, results, the result of an action is gradually shared by its doer, its director and its supporter. My dear respectable ladies and gentlemen, according to the authoritative statements of Shastra, there must be a supreme authority who is able to award the respective benefits of our present activities. Otherwise, why should there be persons who are unusually beautiful and powerful both in this life and in the life after death? This is confirmed not only by the evidence of the Vedas but also by the personal behavior of great personalities like Manu, Uttanapada, Dhruva, Priyavrata and my grandfather Anga, as well as by many other great personalities and ordinary living entities, exemplified by Maharaj Prahlad and Bali, all of whom are theists, believing in the existence of the Supreme Personality of Godhead who carries a club. Although abominable persons like my father Veena, the grandson of, grandson of death personified, are bewildered on the path of religion, all the great personalities like those mentioned agree that in this world the only bestower of the benedictions of religion, economic development, sense gratification, liberation or elevation to the heavenly planets is the Supreme Personality of Godhead. By the inclination to serve the lotus feet of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, suffering humanity can immediately cleanse the dirt which has accumulated in their minds during innumerable births, like the Ganges water which emanates from the toes of the lotus feet of the Lord. Such a process immediately cleanses the mind, and thus spiritual or Krishna consciousness gradually increases. When a devotee takes shelter at the lotus feet of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, he is completely cleansed of all misunderstanding or mental speculation and he manifests renunciation. This is possible only when one is strengthened, strengthened by practicing Bhakti Yoga. Once having taken shelter at the root of 
of the lotus feet of the Lord, a devotee never comes back to this material existence, which is full of the threefold miseries. Prithu Maharaj advised his citizens, engaging your minds, your words, your bodies and the results of your occupational duties and being always open-minded, you should all render devotional service to the Lord, according to your abilities and the occupations in which you are situated. You should engage your service at the lotus feet of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, which is with full confidence and without reservation. Then you will surely be successful in achieving the final objective in your lives. The Supreme Personality of Godhead is transcendental and not contaminated by this material world. But although he is concentrated spirit soul without material varieties for the benefit of the conditioned soul, he nevertheless accepts different types of sacrifices performed with various material elements, rituals and mantras and offered to the demigods under different names according to the interests and purpose or purposes of the performers. The Supreme Personality of Godhead is all pervading but he is also manifested in different types of bodies which arise from a combination of material nature, time, desires and, comp and occupational duties. Thus different types of consciousness develop, just as fire, which is always basically the same, blazes in different ways according to the shape and dimension of firewood. The Supreme Personality of God is the master and enjoyer of the results of all sacrifices, and he is the Supreme Spiritual Master as well. All of you citizens on the surface of the globe who have a relationship with me and are worshipping him by dint of your occup occupational duties are bestowing your mercy upon me. Therefore, O oh my citizens, I thank you. The Brahmanas and Vaishnavas are personally glorified by their charistic powers of tolerance, penance, knowledge and education. By dint of all these spiritual assets, Vaishnavas are more powerful than roy royalty. It is therefore advised that the princely order not exhibit its material prowess before these two communities and should avoid offending them. The Supreme Personality of Godhead, the ancient eternal Godhead, who is foremost among all great personalities, obtained the opulence of his staunch reputation which purifies the entire universe by worshipping the lotus feet of those Brahmanas and Vaishnavas. The Supreme Personality of Godhead, who is everlastingly independent and who exists in every heart, is very pleased with those who follow in his footsteps and engage without reservation in the service of the descendants of Brahmanas and Vaishnavas, for he is always dear to Brahmanas and Vaishnavas, and they are always dear to him. By regular, by regular service to the Brahmanas and Vaishnavas, one can clear the dirt from his heart and thus enjoy supreme peace and liberation from material attachment and be satisfied. In this world there is no fruitive activity superior to serving the Brahmana class, for this can bring pleasure to the demigods for whom the many sacrifices are recommended. Although the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Ananta, eats through the fire sacrifices offered in the names of the different demigods, he does not take as much pleasure in eating through fire as he does in accepting offerings to the mouths of learned sages and devotees, for then he does not leave the association of devotees. In Brahminical culture, a Brahmana's transcendental position is eternally maintained because the injunctions of the Vedas are accepted with faith, austerity, scriptural conclusions, full sense and mind control and meditation. In this way, the real goal of life is illuminated, just as one's face is fully reflected in a clear mirror. O respectable personalities present here, I beg the blessings of all of you that I may perpetually carry on my crown, the dust of the lotus feet of such Brahmanas and Vaishnavas until the end of my life. He who can carry such dust on his head is very soon relieved of all the reactions which arise from sinful life and eventually he develops all good and desirable qualities. Whoever acquires the Brahminical qualifications, whose only wealth is good behavior, who is grateful and who takes shelter of experienced persons, gets all, gets all the opulences of the world. I therefore wish that the Supreme Personality of Godhead and his associates be pleased with the Brahmana class, with the cows and with me. 
The great sage Maitreya said, after hearing King Prithu speak so nicely, all the demigods, all the denizens of Pitriloka, the brahmanas and the saintly persons present at the meeting congratulated him by expressing their good will. They all declared that the Vedic conclusions that one can conquer the heavenly planets by the actions of the Putra or Sun was fulfilled for the most sinful Veena who had been killed by the curse of the Brahmanas was now delivered from the darkest region of hellish life by his son Maharaj Prithu. Similarly, Hiranyakashipu, who by dint of his sinful activities always defied the supremacy of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, entered into the darkest region of hellish life. But by the grace of, of his great son, Prahlad Maharaj, he also was delivered and went back home, back to Godhead. All the saintly Brahmanas thus addressed Prithu Maharaj, O best of the warriors, O father of this globe, may you be blessed with a long life, for you have great devotion to the infallible Supreme Personality of Godhead, who is the master of all the universe. The audience continued, Dear King Prithu, your reputation is the purest of all, for you are preaching the glories of the most glorified of all, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, the Lord of the Brahmanas. Sin since due to our great fortune we have you as our master, we think that we are living directly under the agency of the Lord. Our dear Lord, it is your occupational duty to rule over your citizens. That is not a very wonderful task for, the, for a personality like you, who are so affectionate in seeing to the interests of the citizens, because you are full of mercy. That is the greatness of your character. The citizens continued, Today you have opened our eyes and revealed how to cross to the other side of the ocean of darkness. By our past deeds and by the arrangement of superior authority, we are entangled in a network of fruitive activities and have lost sight of the destination of life. Thus we have been wandering within the universe. Dear Lord, you are situated in your pure existential position of goodness. Therefore you are the perfect representative of the Supreme Lord. You are glorified by your own prowess and thus you are maintaining the entire world by introducing Brahminical culture and protecting everyone in your line of duty as a Chatriya. Thus end the Bhaktivedanta purports of the fourth canto, 21st chapter of the Srimad Bhagavatam, entitled Instructions by Maharaj Prithu. 22. Prithu Maharaj meeting with the four Kumaras. The great sage Maitreya said, while the citizens were thus praying to the most powerful King Prithu, the four Kumaras, who were as bright as the sun, arrived on the spot. Seeing the glowing effulgence of the four Kumaras, the masters of all mystic power, the king and his associates could recognize them as, as they descended from the sky. Seeing the four Kumaras, Prithu Maharaj was greatly anxious to receive them. Therefore, the king, with all his officers, very hastily got up as anxiously as a conditioned soul, whose senses are immediately attracted by the modes of material nature. When the great sages accepted their reception according to the instructions of the Shastras and finally took their seats offered by the king, the king influenced by the glories of the sages immediately bowed down, Thus he worshipped the four Kumaras. After this the king took the water which had washed the lotus feet of the Kumaras and sprinkled it over his hair. By such respectful actions the king as an exemplary personality showed how to receive a spiritually advanced personality. The four great sages were elder to Lord Shiva and when they were seated on the golden throne they appeared just like fire blazing on an altar. Maharaj Prithu, out of his great gentleness and respect for them, began to speak with great restraint as follows. King Prithu spoke, My dear great sages, auspiciousness personified, it is very difficult for even the mystic yogis to see you. Indeed, you are very rarely seen. I do not know what kind of pious activity I performed for you to grace me by appearing before me without difficulty. Any person upon whom the Brahmanas and Vaishnavas are pleased can achieve anything which is very rare to obtain in this world as well as after death. Not only that, but one who also receives the favor of the auspicious Lord Shiva and Lord Vishnu who accompany the Brahmanas and Vaishnavas. 
Petu Maharaj continued, although you are traveling in all planetary systems, people cannot know you, just as they cannot know the Super Soul, although he is within everyone's heart as the witness of everything, even Lord Brahma and Lord Shiva cannot understand the Super Soul. A person who is not very rich and is attached to family life becomes highly glorified when saintly persons are present in his home. The master and servants who are engaged in offering the exalted visitors water, a sitting place and paraphernalia for reception are glorified and the home itself is also glorified. On the contrary, even though full of all opulences and material prosperity, any householder's house where the devotees of the Lord are never allowed to come in and where there is no water for washing their feet is to be considered a tree in which all venomous serpents live. Maharaj Prithu offered his welcome to the four Kumaras, addressing them as the best of the Brahmanas. He welcomed them, saying, From the beginning of your birth you strictly observed the vows of celibacy and although you are experienced in the path of liberation, you are keeping yourself just like small children. Prithu Maharaj inquired from the sages about persons entangled in this dangerous material existence because of their previous actions. Could such persons, whose only aim is sense gratification, be blessed with any good fortune? Prithu Maharaj continued, My dear sirs, there is no need to ask about your good and bad fortune because you are always absorbed in spiritual bliss. The mental concoction of the auspicious and inauspicious does not exist in, exist in you. I am completely assured that personalities like you are the only friends for persons who are blazing in the fire of material existence. I therefore ask you how in this material world we can very soon achieve the ultimate goal of life. The Supreme Personality of Godhead is always anxious to elevate the living entities who are his parts and parcels, and for their special benefit the Lord travels all over the world in the form of self-realized persons like you. The great sage Matera continued, this, thus Sanat Kumara, the best of the celibates, after hearing the speech of Prithu Maharaj, which was meaningful, appropriate, full of precise words and very sweet to hear, smiled, smiled with full satisfaction and began to speak as follows. Sanat Kumara said, My dear King Prithu, I am very nicely questioned by you. Such questions are beneficial for all living entities especially because they are raised by you, who are always thinking of the good of others. Although you know everything, you ask such questions because that is the behavior of saintly persons. Such intelligence is befitting your position. When there is a congregation of devotees, the discussions, questions and answers become conclusive to both the speaker and the audience. Thus, such a meeting is beneficial for everyone's real happiness. Sanat Kumara continued, My dear King, you already have an inclination to glorify the lotus feet of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Such attachment is very difficult to achieve, but when one has attained such unflinching faith in the Lord, it automatically cleanses lusty desires from the core of the heart. It has been conclusively decided in the scriptures, after due, due consideration, that the ultimate goal for the welfare of human society is detachment from the bodily concept of life and increased and steadfast attachment for the Supreme Lord, who is transcendental beyond the modes of material nature. Attachment for the Supreme can be increased by practicing devotional service, inquiring about the Supreme Personality of Godhead, applying Bhakti Yoga in life, worshipping the Yogeshwara, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, and by hearing and chanting about the glories of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. These actions are pious in themselves. One has to make progress in spiritual life by not associating with persons who are simply interested in sense gratification and making money. Not only such persons, but one who associates with such persons could be avoided. One should mold his life in such a way that he cannot live in peace without drinking the nectar of the glorification of the Supreme Personality of God at Hari. One can be thus elevated by being disgusted with the taste for sense enjoyment. A candidate for spiritual advancement must be non-violent, must follow in the footsteps of great Acharyas, must always remember the nectar of the pastimes of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, must follow the regulative principles without material desire, 
and following the regulative principle should not blaspheme others. A devotee should lead a very simple life and not be disturbed by the duality of opposing elements. He should learn to tolerate them. The devotee should gradually increase the culture of devotional service by constantly hearing of the transcendental qualities of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. These pastimes are like ornamental decorations on the ears of devotees. By rendering devotional service and transcending the material qualities, one can easily be fixed in transcendence in the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Upon becoming fixed in his attachment to the Supreme Personality of Godhead by the grace of the spiritual master and by awakening knowledge and detachment, the living entity situated within the heart of the body and covered by the five elements burns up his material surroundings, exactly as fire rises from wood, burns the wood itself. When a person becomes devoid of all material desires and liberated from all material qualities, he transcends distinctions between actions executed externally and internally. At that time, the difference between the soul and the supersoul, which was existing before self-realization, is annihilated. When a dream is over, there is no longer a distinction between the dream and the dreamer. When the soul exists for sense gratification, he creates different desires, and for that reason he becomes subjected to designations. But when one is in the transcendental position, he is no longer interested, interested in anything except fulfilling the desires of the Lord. Only because of different causes does a person see a difference between himself and others, just as one sees the reflection of a body appearing differently manifested on water, on oil or in a mirror. When one's mind and senses are attracted to sense objects for enjoyment, the mind becomes agitated. As a result of continually thinking of sense objects, one's real consciousness almost becomes lost, like the water in a lake that is gradually sucked up by the big grass draws on its bank. When one deviates from his original consciousness, he loses the capacity to remember his previous position or recognize his present one. When remembrance is lost, all knowledge acquired is based on false foundation. When this occurs, learned scholars consider that the soul is lost. There is no stronger obstructions, obstruction to one's self-interest than, than thinking other subject matters to be more pleasing than one's self-realization. For human society, constantly thinking of how to earn money and apply it for sense gratification brings about the destructions of everyone's interests. When one becomes devoid of knowledge and devotional service, he enters into the species of life like those of trees and stones. Those who strongly desire to cross the ocean of nations must not associate with the modes of ignorance, for hedonistic activities are the greatest obstructions to realization of religious principles, economic development, regulated sense gratification and at last liberation. Out of the four principles, namely religion, economic development, sense gratification and liberation, liberation has to be taken very seriously. The other three are subject to destruction by the stringent laws of nature, death. We accept as blessings different stages of higher life, distinguishing them from lower stages of life. But we should know that such distinctions exist only in relation to the interchange of the modes of material nature. Actually, these states of life have no permanent existence, for all of them will be destroyed by the Supreme Controller. Sanat Kumara advised the king, Therefore, my dear King Prithu, try to understand the Supreme Personality of Godhead, who is living within everyone's heart, although along with the individual soul. In each and every body, either moving or not, not moving, the individual souls are fully covered by the gross material body and subtle body made of the life, air and intelligence. The Supreme Personality of Godhead manifests himself as one with the cause and effect within this body, but one who has transcended the illusory energy by deliberate consideration which clears the misconception of a snake for a rope can understand that the Paramatma is eternally transcendental to the material creation and situated in pure internal energy. Thus the Lord is transcendental to all material contamination. 
and to him only was must one surrender. The devotees who are always engaged in the service of the toes of the lotus feet of the Lord can very easily overcome hard-knotted desires for fruitive activities. Because this is very difficult, the non-devotees, the jnanis and yogis, although trying to stop the waves of sense gratification, cannot do so. Therefore you are advised to engage in the devotional service of Krishna, the son of Vasudeva. The ocean of Nashians is very difficult to cross because it is infested with many dangerous sharks. Although those who are non-devotees undergo severe austerities and penances to cross that ocean, we recommend that you simply take shelter of the lotus feet of the Lord, which are like boats for crossing the ocean. Although the ocean is difficult to cross by taking shelter of his lotus feet, you will overcome all dangers. The great sage Maitreya continued, being thus enlightened in complete spiritual knowledge by the son of Brahma, one of the Kumaras, who was complete in spiritual knowledge, the king worshipped them in the following words. The king said, O Brahmana, O powerful one, formerly Lord Vishnu showed me his causeless mercy, indicating that you would come to my house, and to confirm that blessing you have all come. My dear Brahmana, you have carried out the order sorrowly, because you are also as compassionate as the Lord. It is my duty, therefore, to offer you something, but all I possess are but remnants of food taken by great saintly persons. What shall I give? The king continued, Therefore, my dear Brahmanas, my life, wife, children, home, furniture and household paraphernalia, my kingdom, strength, land and especially my treasury, are all offered unto you. Since only a person who is completely educated according to the principles of Vedic knowledge deserves to be commander-in-chief, ruler of the state, the first to chastise and the proprietor of the whole planet, Prithumaraj offered everything to the Kumaras. The Kshatriyas, Vaishyas and Shudras eat their food by virtue of the Brahmana's mercy. It is the Brahmanas who enjoy their own property, clothe themselves with their own property and give charity with their own property. Prithu Maharaj continued, How can such persons who have rendered unlimited service by explaining the path of self-realization in relation to the Supreme Personality of Godhead and whose explanations are given for our enlightenment with complete conviction and Vedic evidence be repaid except by folded palms containing water for their satisfaction? Such great personalities can be satisfied only by their own activities, which are distributed amongst human society out of their unlimited mercy. The great sage Maitreya continued, being thus worshipped by Maharaj Prithu, the four Kumaras, who were masters of devotional service, became very pleased. Indeed, they appeared in the sky and praised the character of the king, and everyone observed them. Amongst great personalities, Maharaj Prithu was achieved by virtue of his fixed position in relation to spiritual enlightenment. He remained satisfied as one who has achieved all success in spiritual understanding. Being self-satisfied, Maharaj Prithu executed his duty as perfectly as possible according to the time and his situation, strength and financial position. position. His only aim in all his activities was to satisfy the absolute truth. In this way he duly acted. Maharaj Prithu completely dedicated himself to be an et eternal servant of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, transcendental to material nature. Consequently, all the fruits of his activities were dedicated to the Lord, and he always thought of himself as a servant of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, who is the proprietor of everything. Maharaj Prithu, who was very opulent due to the prosperity of his entire empire, remained at home as a householder. Since he was never inclined to utilize his opulence for the gratification of his senses, he remained unattached, exactly like the sun, which is unaffected in all circumstances. Being situated in the liberated position of devotional service, Prithu Maharaj not only performed all fruitive activities, but also begot five sons by his wife, Archie. Indeed, all his other sons were begotting according to his own desire. After begetting five sons, named Vijitaswa, Dum, Rakesha, Hariyaksha, Dravina and Vrika, Prithu Maharaj continued to rule the planet. He accepted all the qualities of the deities who governed all other planets. 
Since Maharaj Prithu was a perfect devotee of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, he wanted to pro protect the Lord's creation by pleasing the various citizens according to their various desires. Therefore Prithu Maharaj used to please them in all respects by his words, mentality, works and gentle behavior. Maharaj Prithu became as celebrated a king as Somaraja, the king of the moon. He was, also he was also powerful and exacting, just like the sun god, who distributes heat and light and at the same time exacts all the planetary waters. Maharaj Prithu was so strong and powerful that no one could disobey his orders any more than one could conquer fire itself. He was so strong that he was compared to Indra, the king of heaven, whose power is in Superable. On the other hand, Maharaj Prithu was also as tolerant as the earth and in fulfilling various desires of human society, he was like heaven itself. Just as rainfall satisfies everyone's heart desires, Maharaj Prithu used to satisfy everyone. He was like the sea in that no one could understand his depths. And he was like Meru, the king of hills, in the fixity of his purpose. Maharaj Prithu's intelligence and education were exactly like that of Yamaraj, the superintendent of death. His opulence was comparable to the Himalayan mountains, there where all valuable jewels and metals are stocked. He possessed great riches like Kuvera, the treasure of, heavenly, of the heavenly planets, and no one could reveal his secrets, for they were like the demigods, demigod Varunas. In his bodily strength and in, in the strength of his senses, Maharaj Prithu was as strong as the wind, which can go anywhere and everywhere. As far as his intolerance was concerned, he was just like the all-powerful Rudra expansion of Lord Shiva or Sada Shiva. In his bodily beauty, he was just like Cupid, and in, in his thoughtfulness, he was like a lion. In his affection, he was just like Swayambhuva Manu, and in his ability to, to control, he was like Lord Brahma. In his personal behavior, Prithu Maharaj exhibited all good qualities, and in spiritual knowledge he was exactly like Brihaspati. In self-control he was like the Supreme Personality of Godhead himself. As far as his devotional service was concerned, he was a great follower of devotees who were attached to cow protection and the rendering of all service to the spiritual master and the brahmanas. He was perfect in his shyness and in his gentle behavior. And when he engaged in some philanthropic activity, he worked as if he were working for his own personal self. Throughout the whole universe, in the higher, lower and middle planetary systems, Prithu Maharaj's reputation was loudly declared and all ladies and saintly persons heard his glories, which were as sweet as the glories of Lord Ramachandra. Thus end the Bhaktivedanta purports of the fourth canto, 22nd chapter of the Srimad Bhagavatam, entitled Prithu Maharaja's Meeting with the Four Kumaras. Chapter 23 Maharaj Prithu's Going Back Home At the last stage of his life, when Maharaj Prithu saw himself getting old, that great soul, who was king of the world, divided whatever opulence he had accumulated amongst all kinds of living entities, moving and non-moving. He arranged pensions for everyone according to religious principles and after executing the orders of the Supreme Personality of Godhead in complete accordance with him, he dedicated his sons unto the earth, which was considered to be his daughter. Then Maharaj Prithu left the presence of his citizens who were almost lamenting and crying from feeling separation from the king and went to the forest alone with his wife to perform austerities. After retiring from family life, Maharaj Prithu strictly followed the regulations of retired life and underwent severe austerities in the forest. He engaged in these activities as seriously as he, has for, as he had formerly engaged in leading the government and conquering everyone. In the Tapovana, Maharaj Prithu sometimes ate the trunks and roots of trees and sometimes he ate fruits fruit and dried leaves, and for some weeks he drank only water. Finally he lived simply by breathing air. Following the principles of forest living and the footsteps of the great sages and munis, Prithu Maharaj accepted five kinds of heating processes during the summer season, exposed himself to torrents of rain in the rainy season, and in the winter stood in water up to his neck. 
He also used to simply lie down on the floor to sleep. Maharaj Prithu underwent all these severe austerities in order to, to, to control his words and his senses, to refrain from discharging his semen and to control the life air within his body. All this he did for the satisfaction of Krishna. He had no other purpose. By thus practicing severe austerities, Maharaj Prithu gradually became steadfast in spiritual life and completely free of all desires for fruitive activities. He also practiced breathing exercises to control his mind and senses, and by such control he became opulently free from all desires for fruitive activity. Thus the best amongst human beings, Maharaj Prithu, followed that path of spiritual advancement which was advised by Sanat Kumara, that is to say, he worshipped the Supreme Personality of Godhead Krishna. Maharaj Prithu thus engaged completely in the devotional service, executing the rules and regulations strictly according to principles, 24 hours daily. Thus his love and devotion unto the Supreme Personality of Godhead Krishna developed and became unflinching and fixed. By regularly discharging devotional service, Prithu Maharaj became transcendental in mind and could therefore constantly think of the lotus feet of the Lord. Because of this, he, he became completely detached and attained perfect knowledge by which he could transcend all doubt. Thus he was freed from the clutches of false ego and the material conception of life. When he became completely free from the conception of bodily life, Maharaj Prithu realized Lord Krishna sitting in everyone's heart as a Paramatma. Being thus able to get all instructions from him, he gave up all other practices of yoga and jnana. He was not even interested in the perfection of the yoga and jnana systems. For he thoroughly realized that devotional service to Krishna is the ultimate goal of life and that unless the yogis and jnanis become attracted to Krishna Kata, narrations about Krishna, the illusions concerning existence can never be dispelled. In due course of time, when Prithu Maharaj was to give up his body, he fixed his mind firmly upon the lotus feet of Krishna, and thus completely situated on the Brahma Bhuta platform, he gave up the material body. When Maharaj Prithu practiced a particular yogic sitting posture, he blocked the doors of his anus with his ankles, pressed his right and left calves, and gradually raised his life air upward, pressing it on to the circle of his navel, up to the heart and throat, and finally pushed it upward to the central position between his two eyebrows. In this way, Prithu Maharaj gradually raised his air of life up to the hole in the skull, whereupon he lost all desire for material existence. Gradually he merged his air of life with the totality of air, his body with the totality of earth, and the fire within his body was the totality of fire. In this way, according to the different positions of the ver various parts of the body, Prithu Maharaj mer merged the holes of his senses with the sky, his bodily liquids such as blood and various secretions with the totality of water, and merged earth with water, then water with fire, fire with air, air with sky, and so on. He amalgamated the mind with the senses and the senses with the sense objects according to their respective positions and he also amalgamated the material ego with the total material energy Mahatattva. Prithu Maharaj then offered the total designation of the living entity unto the supreme controller of illusory energy. Being released from all the designations by which the living entity became entrapped, he became free by knowledge and renunciation by the spiritual force of his devotional service. In this way, being situated in his original constitutional position of Krishna consciousness, he gave up his body as a Prabhu or controller of the senses. The queen, the wife of King the Queen, the wife of Prithumaraj, whose name was Archie, followed her husband into the forest. Since she was a queen, her body was very de very delicate. Although she did not deserve to live in the forest, she voluntarily Lee touched her lotus feet to the ground. Although she was not accustomed to such difficulties, Queen Archie followed her husband in the regulative principles of living in the forest like great sages. She lay down on the ground and ate only fruits, flowers and leaves, and because she was not fit for these activities she became frail and thin. Yet because of the pleasure she derived in serving her husband, she did not feel any difficulties. 
When Queen Archie saw that her husband, who had been so merciful to her and the earth, no longer showed symptoms of life, she lamented for a little while and then built a fiery pyre on top of a hill and placed the body of her husband on it. After this the queen executed the necessary funeral functions and offered oblations of water. After basing in the river she offered obeisances to various demigods situated in the sky in the different planetary systems. She then circumambulated the fire and while thinking of the lotus feet of her husband entered its flames. After observing this brave act performed by the chaste wife Archie, the, wi the wife of the great king Pritu, man uh, many thousands of the wives of demigods along with their husbands offered prayers to the queen for they were very much satisfied. At, the time, at that time the demigods were situated on the top of Mandara hill and all their wives began to shower flowers on the funeral pyre and began to talk amongst themselves as follows. The wives of the demigods said, All glories to Queen Archie. We can see that this queen of the great King Pritu, the emperor of all the kings of the world, has served her husband with mind, speech and body exactly as the goddess of fortune serves the supreme personality of Godhead, Yagnyeshwada or Vishnu. The wives of the demigods continued, Just see how this chaste lady, Archie, by dint of her inconceivable pious activities, is still following her husband upward, as far as we can see. In this material world, every human being has a short span of life, but those who are engaged in devotional service go back home, back to Godhead, for they are actually on the path of liberation. For such persons there is nothing which is not available. Any person who engages himself within this material world in performing activities that necessi necessitate great struggle and who, after obtaining a human form of life, which is a chance to attain liberation from miseries, undertake the difficult task of fruitive activities, must be considered to be cheated and envious of his own self. The great sage Maitreya continued speaking, My dear Vidura, when the wives of the denizens of heaven were thus talking amongst themselves. Queen Archie reached the planet which her husband, Maharaj Prithu, the topmost self-realized soul, had attained. Maitreya continued, the greatest of all devotees, Maharaj Prithu, was very powerful and his character was lib liberal, magnificent and magnanimous. Thus I have described him to you as far as possible. Any person who describes the great characteristic of Prithu Maharaj with faith and determination whether he reads or hears of them himself or helps others to hear of them is certainly to attain the very planet which Maharaj Prithu attained. In other words, such a person also returns home to the Vaikuntha planets back to Godhead. If one hears of the characteristics of Prithu Maharaj and is a Brahmana, he becomes perfectly qualified with Brahminical powers. If he is a Kshatriya, he becomes a king of the world. If he is a Vaishya, he becomes a master of other Vaishyas and many animals, and if he is a Shudra, he becomes the topmost devotee. It does not matter whether one is a man or a woman, anyone who with great respect hears this narration of Maharaj Pitu will become the father of many children if he is without children, and will become the richest of men if he is without money. Also, one who hears this narration three times will become very reputable if he is not recognized in society and he will become a great scholar if he is illiterate. In other words, hearing the narration of Prithu Maharaj is so auspicious that it drives away all bad luck. By hearing the narration of Prithu Maharaj, one can become great, increase his duration of life, gain promotion to the heavenly planets, counteract the contamination of this age of Kali. In addition, one can promote the causes of religion, economic development, sense gratification and liberation. Therefore, from all sides, it is advisable for a materialistic person who is interested in such things to read or hear the narration of the life and character of Prithu Maharaja. If a king who is desirous of attaining victory and ruling power chants the narration of Prithu Maharaj three times before going forth on his chariot, all subordinate kings will automatically render all kinds of taxes unto him 
as they render them unto Maharaj Prithu simply upon his order. A pure devotee who is executing the different processes of devotional service may be situated in the transcendental position, being completely absorbed in Krishna consciousness, but even he, while discharging devotional service, must hear, read and induce others to hear about the character of and life of Prithu Maharaja. The great sage Maitreya continued, My dear Vidura, I have as far as possible spoken, spoken the narrations about Prithu Maharaj, which enrich one's devotional attitude. Whoever takes advantage of these benefits also goes back home, back to Godhead, like Maharaj Prithu. Whoever with great reverence and adoration regularly reads, chants and describes the histories of Maharaj Prithu's activities will certainly increase unflinching faith and attraction for the lotus feet of the Lord. The Lord's lotus feet are the bo boat by which one can cross the ocean of nations. Thus end the Bhaktivedanta purports of the fourth canto, twenty-third chapter of the Srimad Bhagavatam, entitled Maharaj Prithu's Going Back Home. Grantaraj Srimad Bhagavatam ki jai, Jagat Guru Srila Prabhupada ki jai, Prithu Maharaj ki jai. All glories to the king of all scriptures, the Srimad Bhagavatam or Bhagavad Purana. All glories to his divine grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta, Swami, Srila Prabhupada. All glories to Prithu Maharaj. This is a very auspicious story. If you hear this three times, you can counteract all the inauspicious uh, influence that is happening on the whole world right now. And this is the best thing for people to take shelter of the ba Srimad Bhagavatam, which is non-different from the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Lord Krishna or Lord Vishnu. Hare Krishna.